Before we get into blockchain, it is very important to understand cryptocurrency. So what exactly is cryptocurrency? You might have heard of different cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether, and even Ripple. But there are a lot more cryptocurrencies out there. Waves, Nexus, Dash, Litecoin, and so on. Cryptocurrencies are basically digital currencies, meaning unlike the dollar bill, which you can actually hold in your hand, a physical object, cryptocurrencies are all digital, meaning it's just bits and bits and ones and zeros. Now, cryptocurrencies are also decentralized currencies, meaning you can simply send them over the internet to anyone in any part of the world. No one controls cryptocurrencies. So it's independent and there is no one who is controlling or generating these currencies. Cryptocurrencies and especially Bitcoin, which is the most famous cryptocurrency, was originally developed by someone named Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, we don't really know if this is an individual person or a group of people. We don't know, and no one knows. And maybe it's a good idea now that no one knows at this point. Satoshi Nakamoto developed and published a white paper on a Bitcoin cryptocurrency, which is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. There are 21 million Bitcoins available, meaning that after 21 million, well, there won't be any. That's the limit of Bitcoins, 21 million Bitcoins. If you want to buy Bitcoin, then you can go to different digital exchanges like Coinbase and go ahead and sign up and buy Bitcoins and other digital currencies, including Ether as well as Litecoin. We're not really interested in Bitcoin cryptocurrency, but it's very, very important to understand that the technology being used behind the Bitcoin is called blockchain. And that is what the course is all about. Now let's go ahead and look at how the blockchain technology works and how it can be used in different aspects of our life. Let's say that John needs to send some money to Mary. And let's also assume that John and Mary are not neighbors, but they live quite far apart, maybe thousands of miles apart. Now, the current way of sending the money from John to Mary includes a middleman. Now, that middleman can be a bank. John is going to send the money to the bank. The bank is going to verify that Mary actually exists, and then the bank is going to send the money to Mary. Now John may be sending $20 and Mary is going to get $18. Now you might be wondering what happened to those $2? Well, that's the cut that the bank is going to charge for the transaction fees. Not only the high transaction fees is a problem with this approach, but also the amount of time the money went from John to Mary. It actually might take three to five business days. And that's just too late. Apart from the money, the transaction fees, the three to five business days, now you have a central place, which is a bank. And if there are bad people like hackers, they only have to hack one bank or one central place to get all the information. Once these hackers hack the bank or that particular central ledger, they can get access to all the accounts, to all their social securities, identification, their addresses, first name, last name, bank account number, routing numbers, and so on. And they can just take the money out of bank and John's account and Mary's account and transfer it to some offshore account. This is not a fantasy world scenario or some sort of a scenario that cannot happen. 
because this has happened a lot of times. We have a lot of examples where the hackers have hacked the central location, the central ledger, and simply taken out the money out of the bank from different people's account and transferred it to their own accounts, which cannot be traced. So this is the main idea of a central ledger. Now let's go ahead and see what a distributed ledger looks like. Let's say that John needs to send some money to Mary. And once again, we will assume that they are not next door neighbors, but they live thousands of miles apart. In this case, we're not really going to use a middleman or a central ledger approach, which we used the last time. Instead of that, we will use different nodes. Now you can think of these nodes as different servers which people are running. These are the volunteers, they are running these nodes. Each node has a copy of a ledger which can record a transaction. So if John is going to say that, hey, I want to send $20 to Mary, all of the ledgers on different nodes, and these can be thousands of nodes, gets updated with that particular transaction saying that John wants to send $20 to Mary. Now this is not only limited to John because a different person like Steve can come in and he says, you know what, send $5 to John. And all the ledgers get updated saying that send $5 to John. The same way Mary can also say, say send $15 to Steve. Once again, all the different ledgers, all on the different nodes, and they can be thousands of different nodes, get updated. Now what happens if Steve is not a good person and Steve is like, I want to change something in one of the ledgers. So he hacks one of those nodes, the server, and changes the transaction and say send instead of $15 from Mary to Steve, to $115. Now the great thing about these nodes is that they are on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So all of these nodes are actually connected to each other. And when one node makes a change, it is validated against all the other nodes. So all the other nodes are going to verify that their ledger is the updated one. And now you can see that there are three nodes which say something different than the one top right node which says it's a completely different thing. So we will ignore that node. We will ignore that particular ledger or that transaction because something wrong with that. All the three nodes have a different copy of the transaction and the, one of those nodes has a different copy. Since three in a democracy will win over one, we will keep the copy which those three have because that might be the correct copy. Now, of course, I'm making this super simple. A lot of different things go on behind the scene. A ledger is not really displaying you the name of the people who are sending money from and to. And that is exactly what we are going to learn in the next lecture, we're going to learn that what the ledger looks like and how the ledger does not really include the name of the people, but actually the ID of the people that is generated and assigned to them. Let's go ahead and talk about public and private keys. We already know that the ledger consists of transactions from the users. Now these transactions can be sent $20 from John to Mary, send $15 from Mary to Steve, and so on. Each of these transactions is signed by the person who is approving these transactions, like John, Steve, and Mary. These signatures are called digital signatures. In order to create a digital signature, you must have a private key as well as a public key. Now, a public key as well as a private key is the 256 hash keys. 
That means that these bits, zeros and ones, can run up to 256 characters. When you need to sign a message or a transaction, you use a formula, you pass in the message, which is the actual transaction, and you sign it with your own private key, which creates a signature. Now remember not to share your private key with anyone. That's why it's called a private key, so keep it safe. Now if you need to verify that it is a legitimate signature, all you need is a message, the signature, and the public key. And then you can verify that whether that particular transaction was correct or not. So in the ledger, if we have a transaction from Mary, say sending $15 from Mary to Steve, what happens if Steve is not a good person? And although Steve cannot fake Mary's digital signature, what if Steve duplicates it? That's where the transaction IDs come into play. Each of the key and message also consists of the transaction ID, which makes it unique. Now you might be thinking, is digital signature secure? Well, digital signature is created using a cryptographic function, which is called SHA-256. That's two to the power of 256. Let's take a look at a very simple example. We're not gonna go into the details of SHA-256, how it actually works, but let's consider it as a black box. If you pass something to that hash function, let's say Mary, it's going to create 256 lengths of ones and zeros. Now, although it looks very random, but they're not random. And the reason I'm saying that it's not random is that if you pass Mary again, it's going to produce the same combinations of ones and zeros. But if you change just a little bit from Mary to Barry and pass it to the SHA-256 hash function, it's going to create a completely different hash. You can see that the hash of Mary is very different from Barry. That's 2 to the power of 256. That's basically like saying that if I select one dot from the screen and I select it 250 times, 256 times, then you have to pick the same exact dot 256 times. So the probability of doing that is, well, close to none. We already know that the ledger is handled and is contained by different nodes. And as I mentioned previously, that these nodes are not like four or five, but these can be thousands and thousands of nodes. So which ledger should we pick? Which is the correct one? There are so many nodes keeping track of all these transactions. One of them we have to pick. That is the leading node. And that is exactly what we are going to learn in our next lecture, the concept of proof of work. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much. Hi and welcome back. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about mining. What exactly is mining? And what are the different concepts behind mining? We already know that we have different servers, which are known as nodes, and each node has a copy of the ledger. Now, let's remove the ledger and talk about the transaction first, because this is how it actually happens. A transaction comes to a node, which can be any transaction, like send $20 from John to Mary, send $5 from Steve to John, and so on. Whenever a transaction comes, each of these nodes, they start doing a very, very complicated computation. Now, that computation is known as proof of work. Now, what exactly is proof of work is that they have to find the hash that, let's say, begins with 30 zeros. 
no, I'm just taking that number 30 as an example, the number of zeros that they have to find in the prefix of the hash, it keeps on changing. So it might be 30 right now, it might be 60, 47, 52, it, it keeps going up as the time goes by. So it gets more and more complicated. Just to give you an idea, if you try to find out, and we'll see later on, a hash with the four zeros instead of the 30, your computer is gonna take a very, very, very long time. So finding 30, finding 60 zeros, uh, that special hash is pretty complicated. Basically, it's not really possible to do it any other way. You just have to kind of guess. A guess is depends on the transaction. So let's say if I'm saying send $5 from Mary to Steve, so that will be the transaction. But what exactly is a nonce? Well, as you have already learned, that each single thing, a uh, transaction or letter, will create a very different hash. It's not random because if you pass in the same string, it's going to produce the same hash. So what we do is we take the transaction and we increment the nonce. It's just an incrementing number. And basically this is where our search begins. So we take the transaction, which is let's say send $5 from Mary to Steve, and then we add one to it. And then we check, have we achieved 30 zeros in the front at the start of the hash? And you can see that we have not. Well, let's go ahead and try out nonce two. And you can still see that we haven't really achieved that. And this process will go on forever and ever and ever um, until you reach the number that can produce 30 zeros in the front or 60 zeros, whichever complexity you're working with. And maybe you'll be able to find it. At that particular large number, if you increment it and you add the transaction to it, you will be able to find the nonce, I mean the hash. Whoever node, whoever server finds that particular hash, a special hash that is containing 30 first zeros, well, that gets a ledger, which is also known as a block, and we'll be referring it to a block from now on. And then that particular node will be allowed to add transactions to that block. So as you can see, the block on the bottom left was able to find the special hash which began with 30 zeros. So it was given a block and then all the transactions that were waiting were added to this block. But now at this point you might be wondering that why would a server, why would a node do all these computations? I mean, that looks like very complicated. It might take a while and it might use a lot of electricity also. And you're correct, it does actually use a lot of electricity. So why are these nodes trying to find that special hash, the special hash that begins with 30 zeros? Well, that's because every time they find it, they get a reward. Initially, they started getting 25 bitcoins, but every four years it's been cutting down to half. So right now in 2018, if they find the special hash which begins with 30 zeros, then they'll get a reward of like 6.25 bitcoins, which depending on the time of the day that you look at the Bitcoin value, that's a pretty nice bonus. Once you have found the hash, it, a block is generated for you and you put all the transactions in that block, and then that block becomes part of other blocks in a chain. And hence, it's called a blockchain. Once it is added to the chain, all the different nodes, and there can be thousands of different nodes, they get an updated copy of the blockchain. And now all these nodes, it might be in thousands and thousands, they have the latest copy of the blockchain, which contains all those transactions which are added in the block that was found before. And then the whole process kind of starts again. 
some other transaction comes in and the nodes start again in their quest to find the hash that begins with 30 zeros. At this point, you might be wondering, what if I can go back and just modify one of the blocks in the blockchain? Well, remember when I said that the hash is computed by using a transaction plus the nonce, which is just an integer being updated to different values, a counter. But there's one more thing to it, which is the hash of the next block will also contain the hash of the previous block. So let's go ahead and see it in an example. So if this is a block zero, which contains three transactions, and there's the hash with 30 zeros, if I want to find the block number one, then I will have to have a transaction plus nonce plus the previous hash. The transaction in this case are the transaction from the block number one. We will have to find the nonce on that. So let's just say the nonce is this huge number again. And then we have to also add in the hash of the previous block, which is this one from block number zero. And then when we do that, we create a new hash that begins with a 30 zeros. Of course, that depends on the value of the nonce because that is how we are changing and just looking for that special 30 zeros hash value. But that is going to allow you to create the hash of the next block, which in this case is block number one. Now, what about if Steve on block number zero, or John in this case actually, on block number zero, wants to change one of the transactions. And instead of sending $5 from Steve to John, John is going to change it and say, go ahead and send $15 from Steve to John. Well, remember when I said that even if you change one single letter, the hash value will be completely different. So that hash is invalid. And if that hash is invalid, the next block is also invalid. The only way to get the value of the block number zero is to, well, mine again. And not only you have to mine the block number zero, but you will have to mine the block number one, and block number two and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and hundred, and two hundred, and thousand, and so on. And even if you are able to mine, which is not possible, but let's just say that even if you're able to mine, we're only talking about one server, one node, and there are thousands of them. And all the other nodes are going to point to the one that is incorrect, and they're going to say, hey, I think the blockchain copy that you're using is incorrect because in the end it's just a democracy. There are a lot more nodes that have a different ledger, that have a different copy of the blockchain and only one of those has been compromised on the server. In order to hack the whole blockchain system, you have to change or hack or alter 51% of the nodes, so 51% of the servers. That's a lot. And then you have to mine them all. So it becomes pretty much impossible to change the blockchain. So blockchain is immutable and it cannot really be changed once anything is written into the blockchain. It is there permanently. And now at this point, I think you already know everything you need to know, the concepts related to the blockchain, the mining, the public-private keys. And I think the next step in this journey is to just let's get started to implement the code and see how it, all of this will look like in code. So if you're ready, let's get started. Hello and welcome back. Now I know that you are really eager to get started, but I just have one more small thing that I need to cover before we can jump into the implementation of the blockchain in iOS. And this lecture is about the longest chain. Let's actually see what longest chain is all about. We already know that the blockchain is just a 
connected view of the blocks. So you have different blocks and they are connected together using the previous hash of the previous block, along with the transactions, along with the index, the nonce, and a bunch of other stuff. When all these blocks are connected together, they form a blockchain. But let's talk about the different nodes. So once the block is actually found and it has been validated by these nodes, that block then becomes part of the blockchain. But what happens if there is some evil node, the node that has been hacked? And that is also creating, that's also finding that secret hash value, hence generating the block. What will then happen? Well, in those scenarios, the tree is going to diverge and it's going to form two different branches. One is going to be pointing to the wrong block and one is going to be pointing to the correct one that has been validated by other nodes. And at this time, the other nodes are going to validate and going to create another block that is going to add it to the blockchain. But so does the evil node, the hack node. It's going to create another block and going to add it to the blockchain. Now, obviously, I'm making it so simple because it's not really easy to create and to win and to find that secret hash with 30 zeros or 60 zeros again and again. So it's a very, the probability of that hacked node, the evil node, to keep finding that hash again and again is extremely low. But let's just assume that it's able to keep up at the start. But then all these nodes validate and they find another block and they add to the blockchain. Same does the evil node, it adds to the blockchain. But then eventually the evil node is going to lose because all of those nodes combined together are creating more blocks and adding to the blockchain. Now, if you're wondering that which path to take, you will always go with the longest path. So you will ignore, you will cross out like I have, you will cross out anything that you have listened from that evil node and you will always take the longest node, in the, uh, which in this case, are the is the block node or the blockchain node which is of the nodes that have validated it correctly and that's the concept of the longest chain